gotta go. For for those of you who haven't uh, met me, I'm Dave Finkelberg. Still can't hear you, Dave. You can't hear me at all. No, you need to hear right on the mic. Put your mouth right on the mic. Okay. How's that? So you, get, you know, you just keep coaching me and I'll try and get it right. I will. I will. Be. That's my middle name. Appreciate you folks for being here this evening. Uh, I know that you have other things that you could be doing tonight. Uh, I also know that you're, we're all here for the same reason. And that is because we all care about education. You all want us to do the very best that we possibly can for education in Idaho. And so we're here to listen to you. Uh, to get started, I want to make sure that we introduce the folks who are sponsoring this forum. Uh, I'd like to start out with Elaine Smith here. Just in case you don't know, Elaine actually has a college degree in education. Uh, something we wish our superintendent had. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she works for the school district. Uh, at least she did according to the uh, information I've been able to find out about her. She's also been a state representative for 10 years. And she's, Eleven. Now, Don't forget that one, one year. This, this one year has been a harder year. Uh, Roy Lacey sitting next to her has been a small business owner, an executive for UP, and for the last five years he's worked for the Idaho Food Bank. Uh, Roy has been state representative for two years and is running for the Senate seat that uh, Edgar Malpi is retiring from. Nate Murphy, I left, is an elected school board member from Pocatello, and he's running for House seat A in District 29. That's the same district that Brian and Elaine are running in. Uh, Cameron Cooper. Uh, it's cool. Cameron Coopin is also an elected school board member from American Falls, and he's one of the principals in Coopin Farms, big potato farming outfit over in American Falls. Cameron's running for House Seat B in District 28. Sam McKee. Sam's running for House CD. Sam is a heavy equipment operator and a small business owner and operator. And uh, Sam had the good sense to marry a school teacher. <laughs> His wife uh, teaches in the Marsh Valley School District. Sam's candidate for House CD in District 28. I also had the good fortune to marry a school teacher. Uh, Linda taught art in secondary schools before she left the classroom to raise our family. Uh, I'm running for the seat currently held by retiring Senator Diane Billio. Thank you for being here tonight, Diane. You're very welcome, I'm pleased. Uh, we're also looking fortunate to uh, have some other candidates here tonight. Uh, Kevin England, running in the Republican primary in District 28. Elmer <laughs> Martinez, County Commission candidate. Legislator also, Elmer is. And Dick Sagnus is a former senator. I don't know if you knew that. Or maybe you were already going to say that. I can't help it. <laughs> 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 you want to take the mic? You are retiring, you know? <laughs> 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 Dick Sagnus is a former senator. I don't know if you knew that. Or maybe you were already going to say that. I can't help it. 
Do you, do you want to add something to <laughs> it? It was very nice of Dr. Sagnus to be here tonight, too. Uh, I, I think you all know uh, that we've got a, uh, a diversity of perspectives. A former senator and county commissioner. Good. I do want to uh, give special thanks to Lynn tonight. Uh, he's the guy who arranged for the building and paid the rent for us this evening. And I appreciate him volunteering. Uh, do we need a more formal introduction? For the for the group that's here, uh, you know the the whole idea. Uh, that I had originally with this was to collect input on the subject of the Luna laws, but most particularly on the subject of technology in the classroom. And that is uh, the greater part of those three pieces of legislation that went through the legislature in uh, 2011. And I'd like to begin with that. Uh, I know that there's a lot of uh, diversity in the room here, and I think that it will create uh, a useful discussion. And it certainly will be informative uh, to me to hear what you folks think. Uh, obviously, this uh, uh, microphone is available, and we've got a second one that we can pass around the room to if you'd be. Uh, wherever you'd be most comfortable speaking. Uh, we'd like to start with, uh, I think, somebody from secondary education, just because they, that was the target of the technology effort, although it certainly is going to affect every level of education uh, eventually. So, uh, is there somebody who'd like to speak up on it? Uh, what they think should be done with technology in the classroom at the secondary levels? Well, um, I could say that um, I really can foresee <laughs> I can foresee uh, teachers at the secondary level, and I'm thinking back to my own experience in the classroom, that could really benefit by a lot of, of workshops and, and uh, some in-depth work during summers or whenever that's possible to increase their ability to use technology to teach concepts. For example, last night my grandson, who is a freshman at Pocatello High School, came over and he was going to take a test today about his world cultures class. It was information coming out of that class. This happened to be about economics. And there were terms like uh, mixed economy, capital, capitalism, socialism, uh, free trade, supply and demand, and all of these, and they were terminologies that ran down the left side of the page, on which he had taken down the definitions probably given to him in a lecture setting by his teacher. Again, I wasn't there, I don't know, but I envisioned that this boy could benefit so much more if he and a team of his fellow students could collaborate with technology to build models of, that would demonstrate how these concepts work and to create in his mind what it is to uh, acquire capital and why would you acquire capital? How would it benefit the person who uh, puts forward the capital? How would it benefit the person who receives that capital? What's possible? And I think that that really 
does take a lot of imagination, but technology can really feed that kid's imagination and he could actually understand that. I'm not sure that it's really difficult for a 16-year-old kid to understand these concepts when they're most interested in his case well, what is the possibility of the Clippers beating the L.A. Lakers? <laughs> and so a, a more down-to-earth uh, use of technology with these models, I think that we need to help our teachers uh, acquire those skills to create those models, to have the technology, and to use it in their classroom to cause their students to work in a collaborative effort on this. So that's just off the top ahead in my, uh, my head in, in my experience in the last 24 hours where I could see that that could really be beneficial. Could I ask my other question? May I ask a question? You're asking me whether you think the Clippers or the Lakers are <laughs> 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 Who are the Clippers and the Lakers? <laughs> We're not on this planet, man. <laughs> Technology isn't going to help you, Dick. <laughs> a lot of people have told me that. <laughs> You had a question, though. I did, but I don't know if you want to say that, no. uh, I would encourage questions. Please do. Well, <laughs> the question I would have for you, Marvin, because I'm fairly familiar with what you did in your classroom, mm -hmm. and how you really do that technology and that kind of And my question is this one. How do you put that in terms of what, because we're looking at some significant issues coming right down the line now in relation to Last year. Uh, or to you. How do you view, how does your view fit with what I'll call for sake of discussion the Luna model? Well, I think it I think it needs to be tweaked and fine-tuned, fine-tuned so that teachers come back in as in the leadership position uh, with this technology that we realize that uh, having adequate class size in terms of teacher ratios to students so that they can really coach kids in their collaborative uh, efforts to, to work with technology and to, to arrive at understanding, deeper understandings than just is acquired by definitions and, and terms. And so I think that teachers have to be brought far more into an important focus in this matter. And teachers are very discouraged right now. Morale is really down. And somehow we've got to reverse that and we've got to, to give more than just lip service that we think teachers are, are really key in the leadership in our classrooms. And I think that the, Whoever's going to make some changes in these laws, they've got to really get back to focusing on teachers and making sure that teachers are well prepared in the use of technology and then make that technology available in each classroom. I know that when we first started having videotape machines, and I found that that was such a key part of showing my students pictures and, and everything about history that they could it would stimulate their imagination. I went out and bought my own television and a VCR so that I had it in my classroom. I could use it anytime I wanted. And I think that we have to have that technology in the classroom that it can be used at all times. And get those teachers the training they need to use it. What do you think about kids having Oh, each, each child having? I think that has to be really monitored. Uh, it has to be monitored to, to make sure that we're, we're on task with that, it's not misused, and that those computers are not abused. I, I can't, I, I'm, I would be very, very reluctant to have the kids take my VCR back and home, back and forth to home, and use it at whatever they wanted to. I'd be very reluctant to let kids take these laptops back and, back and forth to home. I, I just can't see how that would work. Just to press that. <laughs> you, maybe. You, <laughs> there are so many different forms. I mean, you're talking about technology in a broad sense. There are so many different forms of technology, taking the iPad and kind of graphics and, sure. and so on. Does it, does it really make sense to focus in on one basic piece of equipment and betting all your eggs in one basket? I would say probably not. But again, uh, 
I would have to be completely retrained if I went back in the classroom. I am, I have limited knowledge in using my own laptop at home, let alone all of the technology that's possible on all these different modes. And we really have to help our teachers become skilled in that. Well, to, to kind of expand on the points that Dick was asking about, I think that professional development is really important so that the educators have the best knowledge to use that tool in the classroom. And I think the best tool in the classroom is still the classroom teacher. And the state is investing more money in computers and people to run computers and techni technical people in school districts than they are investing in the classroom teacher. And I think that is the wrong direction for us to be going, that the classroom teacher is still the key to a child's success in learning. So tweaking, maybe I would go all the way the other direction and just say, let's repeal these laws and start over with teacher, administrator, school board input so that we can do reform in the right way and not take a bad idea and tweak it. <laughs> Uh, if, if, I, if I may, please, just, just for a second. You know, I, I think that all of us believe that, and, that technology in the classroom is wonderful. And I've been through some of the Pocatello schools, and they have a lot of technology, and it's great, and they can use it great. But the problem with these laws were, was the way they're going to pay for it. By taking the teachers out of the classroom, you cannot have a classroom without a teacher with just computers. It's not going to work with these children. Uh, the, it was not thought out very well, uh, and that was the part I think that a lot of people uh, have a problem with. It's not so much that computers are not available, although, you know, I, I don't see very many high school kids leaving high school that aren't pretty savvy <laughs> computer-wise. You know, I, 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 I can talk to my, uh, my nephew, who is, he's in college now, but he was 16 at the time. As I got my new smartphone, I call him up and say, Tanner, what do I do? He's also grandpa, bump, 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 and that's all I do at work. So uh, I, I think the, the kids understand this. Um, I think that what Mara was saying about having groups together uh, with your computers and putting models together, you know, when I was going to college, we did that. Uh, not with computers, but we had work groups at that time and put models together. I think the biggest thing on this is, is the way it was pushed through, uh, very um, ill thought through, it did not have enough time. Um, I visited with uh, Superintendent Luna uh, last year and asked him to slow it down. And he was not interested in slowing anything down. But they, they put the whole uh, NEMIS on the teacher. They've made the teachers the bad people, and they're not. And this is something with, with a computer and a good teacher, the kids could, could go to do a lot of things. And we just need to find a different way to pay for it. Maybe, you know, and, and there's a lot of school districts that do have a lot of money to do that. So another question. Um, when Dr. Luna came to our school, I asked him, basically I said, He's not a doctor. Oh. He doesn't even have an education degree. Oh. He's never been in the classroom. Excuse me, I thought he had a doctor or something else. Pardon me. Anyway, when he came to our school, I asked him, so basically, it's true that you're paying for the computers with teach, letting go of teachers. And he danced all around it. No, 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 we're not. And when he came back to it, he he, he was. And, and I said, I have 32 kids in my classroom. And I said, and you, you can't tell me that that's a good thing. And especially in the lower grades, if you're teaching kids to read, computers cannot do that. I don't care how good technology is. When you are teaching kids to read, you need a teacher. And his whole theory is based on all these studies. 
And the studies are true that you can have these schools that do the best around the world and even in the United States are, best on, are based on very high technology, okay? And even higher, higher numbers of students in the classroom. And I'll buy that. But they're based also on teachers who are paid very high salaries, okay? And so he's very proud to tell us that he might give us a $2,000 raise next year if we meet AYP. If you pay all of these teachers here $2,000 a year until we retire, we are still not going to be paid, highly paid teachers. Big whoop. Make us highly paid teachers, okay? And I don't care. People that are in the government in Idaho right now are never going to make us highly paid teachers. Get rid of the model. Because the model is wonderful if you have all three pieces of the model. High technology, yeah, you can make the classrooms bigger after they learn to read. If you have highly paid teachers, but I'm sorry, Idaho is never going to pay their teachers if you keep people in that are in. That's all there is to it. And you have people like Anders in there who's been on our school board who is very happy to pay us barely above minimum wage. And you have people like Gettys who says, and I quote, teachers make plenty of money for what they do. That's the sad truth in Idaho. So you have that triangle model that Mr. Luna is so proud of. And he's, that's the model. It's, the, what else can you say? And it makes me, I know I get angry, but that's, <laughs> that's it. She come by that natural. Yeah, can you see where I get my... <laughs> Dave, would you have people identify themselves? Yeah, I was, oh, was going to... Yeah. Sorry, Joe, I'm Joni Whitworth Sorensen, <laughs> Mr. Whitworth's daughter, and I am a teacher. <laughs> and where are you a teacher from? McCammon. No. So you're Marsh Valley area. Yes. Uh, Joni, we understand that frustration. Uh, you're certainly not the only person in Banning or Power Counties or and a lot of other counties in the state of Idaho feels that way. Uh, the, you mentioned something that I think is really important, uh, and that is the fact that uh, how you measure uh, AYP, uh, annual yearly progress, I believe, uh, that is an issue, and that issue is uh, where do you start to make that measurement? If you measure, do you measure against arbitrary standards or do you measure against where those students were at the beginning of the year versus where they are at the end of the year? Because there is a huge difference. Uh, you know, some demographics, uh, you will have students who are way ahead of grade level and some demographics where they're way behind and how can you possibly compare those two groups so that's one of the issues that education faces and i'm not sure where that fits with the question of technology but i do understand and i didn't want to let that point that you made oh and that's by. another thing a hundred percent by by the year 2014 i'm sorry but you're not going to have 100% proficient by the year. Ever. 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 Yeah. Ever. I had one year. Well, I did. I had 100% one year because I had the perfect little class. When I had and then kids. in April, I had a student move in. <laughs> and Miss Gow said she made 100% with 12 kids. You hit it your hand. One time. I'm Paul Ish. I been a teacher. I taught with Karen way back when, uh, 36th year in primary grades. Um, I, I'm going to sidestep being a teacher and step to a grandfather. I uh, just had, my grandson has been in 
the Nampa School District for this past year. Um, excelled in kindergarten in Post Falls. Went to Nampa, um, and I don't mean to knock the teacher, you won't ever know her or anything, but she has a new technology. She has a little pad that she carries around. She writes on it. She spends the entire morning writing on her little pad, putting it on overhead, and the kids sit at their desks and do it on an overhead. It got to be December-ish. Um, the IRI was coming up. My grandson was reading 10 words, of, 10 words a minute. He came for Christmas. I said, what's going on? <laughs> He's bright. Why is he only reading 10 words a minute? Well, I go and visit the class. She sits at the desk. She writes on the little Thing, puts it on the screen and that's all they do and he's not interested. I watch him, he looks around, he starts drawing pictures and so during Christmas break grandpa got him <laughs> and we caught him up past his 23, he got 25. So finally they moved to twin and she decided that she'd just bring him to Incan. So we're trying to get to 53. But you're right, you've got to have people trained with the technology. It's not age appropriate to have first graders sit the entire morning copying off a whiteboard. Technology is wonderful if you use it correctly, but if you're not trained and you're using it incorrectly, you're doing damage to these kids. They don't need to sit in their seat all morning long. They're not college students. They're not taking notes off a whiteboard. It's ridiculous. And to say that you put 32 kids in a class, I challenge you to visit Star Elementary, wherever that is, because that's his flagship, that's flagship. Superintendent Luna's flagship. That is the model. There's 32 students, they're all excelling there, and they have their, all their little their computer things and their iPads and stuff, and that's their, his example. I would like to pull up their test scores and challenge them against ours, because I, I don't think they can beat them, but uh, I'd just like to see their test scores. I'd like to visit and see actually how it's run. Find their demographics and see how it's run. Back to teaching. Now I'm, I'm stepping back to teaching. <laughs> you never start anything by just dumping money and, and stuff into something. If the people, it goes back to the same thing I was talking about. If people aren't trained, you don't build it from the bottom. Here's our guy. This guy is the guy in our district that should have decided what computer programs we needed, what computer uh, thing we needed. The money should have gone to our district. Our district should have decided. We should have built a base, find out what wiring we had, what connections we needed what rooms we had available, what our teachers needed, what our teachers were trained in. This guy knows all that. It doesn't need to come from the top down and dump stuff on us and dump a bunch of rules on us and a bunch of restrictions on us. It makes no sense at all to try to squeeze us all into the same box. That's like telling kids, we're going to squeeze you all in the same box. It doesn't ever work. If you were a teacher and if you had ever taught in a classroom, he wouldn't know that. Anyway. Good job. Yes. <laughs> a lot of you don't know that I came here in 67, Dick Sifness knows that, and Diane, I hired your mother. Um, Do you want to introduce yourself, Kane? Pardon me? Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? These people don't Let's know, know you. you. Keen Hilfley. Um, it was the largest federal grant west of the Mississippi. Uh, it's called the Laboratory for Children Learning Disabilities. It's housed in the basement of College of Ebb. The point I want to do is just establish a little bit about the thread that runs through all of learning. You teachers are right on the ball here. I'm not so sure about technology ever superseding that one human beingness. The, to me, the most dominant feature, the most concerning issue that's going on in this world top to bottom, from the president to the youngest human being in the United States, is critical thinking. We do not have people who are able to critically think. And you cannot do this with computers or technology. You can provide stimulus, you can set it up, but unless you have an interaction with the person, most of learning is emotional, and you know that. And computers don't do that in any kind of technology. So. Uh, Mr. Finkelberg and all of you, I hope that what you'll really stress from this point on is critical thinking. We don't have adults in America, we don't have adults in Congress, we don't have adults in, in the state legislature that are capable of knowing the difference between truth and fiction and fact. You know, fact. 
that kind of stuff needs to be learned, and that has to happen between people. That's what I'm Uh, my name is Eric D'Amico. I came because my son was invited to come and he's got homework. Yeah. Um, so he sent me to, to talk and kind of ties everything in together. He's a 17 year old, he's a junior at Pokey. Um, he's an honor student, he's the president of the National Honor Society. He's, he's a, I like to think he's a relatively bright kid. Um, he'll actually take classes at ISU next year. He'll leave Pokey as a sophomore in college. So he, he knows the system pretty good. He's taking online classes. Uh, what he'd like to say is they're not for him. He's worried that the state's going to view it as a, a one solution for everybody, and that's not him. He, uh, he's not an online learner. He never will be. Uh, he believes that you know reading three blog statements and commenting on two of them is not a stimulating discussion. He would much rather have the discussion in his AP World History class on the merits of economics before World War One. Uh, he likes to see the people he's talking to because he learns about people and that's I mean kind of what Keen was talking about is that, that human interaction is part of learning it's, and he's just not one of those people but I'm also going to I still substitute and I'm going to substitute in the sixth grade classroom with the Promethean board tomorrow and, and that teacher has turned the classroom into an incredible environment with that Promethean board she, has all of her textbooks downloaded on a Promethean board, so you can't get away with it. I don't get it. I can't find her on the page. She pulls up the whole page for you. She can jump to a video on the concept and come back to the page in the workbook. Uh, kids can come up and actually write on the Promethean board and do their work on the page in their textbook. I mean, she has done a wonderful job, but it's back to that training them to do the job. Um, she has the skills. She has the, the tools. Um, but is it for everybody? No, my son would love that sixth grade classroom, but he doesn't like a computer high school classroom. He, he likes the people, he likes the discussions that come with it. He doesn't read on a blog. But he does have one thing though, in his AP history class last year, his textbook had Bill Clinton's first term. He kind of thinks it'd be neat if all their, they're gonna give them all a computer that they just download their textbooks on the computers, and they'll be currently updated, and they'll always be there. And teachers could actually choose the chapters they want. They wouldn't have to buy the whole book. They could pick the chapters they were actually going to teach and download them on the book. My wife does that at the university with her classes. The students only download the classes they want. The, they, she downloads the chapters she's going to teach out of the book so the kids don't have to buy the whole book. You know, it's, there's a lot of neat ways to use that technology other than just a rote memorization, staring into a machine, clicking A and hitting the enter button. That's not what it's all about. There's a lot of creative ways to do that. I have just a, just a quick comment. I'd be interested in hearing the candidate's uh, opinion on this because I, as I sit here and listen to this, it just is exciting to me to see and look at the talent that's sitting in this room and the knowledge. And I think one of the big problems we have, whether it be at the federal or state level, is we have too many who would dictate what we should do in Pocatello from Boise or Washington. And, and I see that as a problem. I see more of the state government giving us the tools to do what needs to be done and then letting us decide locally what ought to happen instead of mandating what we should do. And so my thought is just that. that we, one of the things that we need to recognize is that our local school boards, what works in Pocatello probably won't work in Soda Springs and Grace. Uh, my, my experience is one size fits all doesn't. That, that just doesn't work. And I'd just be interested in hearing the candidates express what, how they feel about that. I, I, I personally feel many times that, our, that legislation uh, many times has a tendency to put a thumb on top of people instead of freeing them and letting them do their thing. And, and I, I, I just recognize how important it is to allow the local talent to say, hey, this is what will work here. This is what we know will work. And when that happens, guess what's going to happen? They're going to see that it works. It, it's going to work. And so I just feel so strongly about that. I, I see a lot of things that come down. I saw a guy with a sign yet that it said, no unfunded mandates. And I went up and said, you know, I really disagree with that. He was really taken back. And I said, I say no mandates. We shouldn't be mandating people what they should do. Let's give them the tools and let them do it. So candidates, what are your thoughts there? Uh, I'd like to say one thing, Kevin. Uh, I really appreciate your input. 
we came here to listen uh, to the folks who are here. Okay, that was part of the ground rules for having this discussion and inviting folks. And uh, so, with that said, uh, yeah, I support we want to hear something. Well, let's let everybody else finish first. Let yeah, yeah, we we will uh, definitely have a. We, uh, Elaine, maybe I should step back just a little bit. Elaine, uh, as a teacher, or as a, someone with actual knowledge of education, uh, which is not me. I know enough just about education to know that I don't know enough about it. Well, I was just you going to again. say that Eric hit on it about the technology and the creativity and the history textbooks because nobody has uh, textbooks in any of the school districts that are up to date on history. I, I would challenge every school district in the United States does not have accurate, up-to-date textbooks. But something that has, I'm surprised hasn't quite been mentioned, technology is a tool for teachers. It's not the ultimate. It's, and how each teacher uses technology is up to the creativity, is up to the training, that each has had. And I agree with what Margaret said. Every person can always use more technology training. I think uh, every single one of us could use more technology training. And at times, I have to go to my son-in-law in Texas and say, would you explain how my computer got such and such a way? But that's it. Technology is a tool for teachers, and I think the Luna's laws forgot that. <laughs> oh, we have somebody over here that. Oh, they have a question. Are you ready or not? Do you need a question answered? No, I don't want to hear you. <laughs> okay. This is Greg Mix. He's he's our I, IT tech for Marsh Valley. And and I'd so rather not use this. I'll just talk loud. He okay? fixes all the computers. He does all that stuff, and he's seen these programs. So you just might want to hear him. <laughs> First of all, I'm a farmer, turned computer nerd. I grew up in Jerome, next to Maxine Bell. You probably know her from the legislature. There were our neighbors. And I grew up on a farm and farmed until I figured out. They're saying you need the mic. Who needs the mic? Me. <laughs> you do. Talk I'll louder. talk louder. No, use yeah. the mic, please. <laughs> Don't be afraid. I tried. The problem is we're hard to hear. <laughs> Turn your hearing aids up. Oh, it's not on. Is it working? No. No. Try it. There. Hello. No. Try this. Sound better? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Uh, I am the technology director for Marsh Valley School District. I grew up on a farm. Learned technology, I went, graduated from school, worked uh, in private industries, aerospace for a long time, worked for ISU for 10 years, then I went to Marsh Valley. Uh, I've been part of this uh, Students Come First, and I agree that it's the right direction, but it is just a tool. Uh, technology will help kids learn, and it does excite a lot of kids. If you've watched them with their computers, it does do a lot. Uh, there are some problems with his mandates and the things he wants. Uh, when I started at Marsh Valley about nine or ten years ago, uh, for a school or a district our size, we received about $60,000 in technology funds a year. We're down to about 38000 now. Uh, the same amount of money comes into the state, but uh, the state decides that they're going to keep a little bit more to do these projects that they have. Uh, and I don't agree with them. But you have to understand some of the mandates and some of the structures that they have is just like uh, building a house. You can't have people out there building houses that don't know what they're doing. And a lot of our school districts do the best they can with what they have. But what they have is they have a history teacher that they ma magically wave the wand over and says, you're our technology guy. He's never seen technology for real. He's read the book, but he's never built a house. So when he goes to build this house, he builds it wrong. A state inspector 
wouldn't sign off on. And that's kind of why the state comes in and tries to tell you what to do. Because the districts can't do it on their own because there's too many small districts around. Uh, one of the problems Idaho has is they haven't mandated, again, to combining every county school district so we don't have all these little teeny school districts everywhere with duplication. It's nice to have community, you know, spirit and whatnot, but Utah back in the 60s combined all theirs. It was tough, everybody had to bite the bullet, but that's just the way it is. Uh, I was just taking some notes on some of the questions that you guys were asking so I could try to answer when it was my turn. I didn't know I had to get that dictated to me, but... <laughs> uh, but in my view, and it's just my opinion, it's not worth a lot, uh, the state needs to invest in curriculum first. If it's uh, software or some type of curriculum, in 1997 when I worked for ISU, uh, the state gave millions of dollars out uh, to hook all the high schools up to the internet, gave them video technology so that they could do distance learning in their classrooms, but they didn't give one piece of uh, curriculum, not one. Within five years, every school uninstalled all the expensive equipment that they were given and threw it in the garbage because there wasn't one piece of curriculum. Ten years later, they came out with this plan. We want to make it better, but they haven't come out with any curriculum. They have made some changes, and they're trying to copy what Utah's done with the Utah Education Network. But Utah funded the colleges to create the curriculum first. Then they hooked them to the cart. So they made the horse do the work before they put the cart on. Idaho's doing it the other way. They put the cart first. We need to go back to curriculum. The problem is, is uh, technology's kind of outran the bounds. Technology's out there. We don't need to buy it. We don't need to invent it. We just need to go get it. It's caught up. Utah kind of wasted their money now. Not really, but in today's terms they have. If you'll go home and go out to a website called Khan Academy, and that's spelled K-H-A-N, academy.com, the young man there was a stockbroker analyst that he created lessons in mathematics on YouTube for his niece to help her with math and it grew from there. Now he's funded with the Bill Gates Foundation and Google and doing quite well. But now he has about 8,000 lessons on there from math to French and everything in between. These lessons are only five to 10 minutes long. They're very good, very stimulating. You need to see what they could do. And it didn't take much technology. And they're free. And they're free. They're free. Really? You can also go to youtube.com slash teachers. There's a brand new screened, filtered site or you can get videos the same way, two to 10 minutes. You can patch these together to make a supplement to the teacher. And what technology will do is just like uh, the auto industry. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, remember all that outcry, robots are gonna replace the workers. Well, how many workers got replaced by robots? None. In fact, they had to hire more workers to take care of the robots. But production went up three times with the help of robots. And that's kind of what technology is going to do, is if you can take the teacher out of the front of the classroom so they're not lecturing all the time, but they can supplement these videos or whatever it is, you know, then they can go back and help the 10 or 20 percent of the kids that have trouble keeping up and push them from the back. You can't pull them from the front. You have to push them from the back. They have to go spend that one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, the big problem with the state funding is just an example, and I don't trust the state or Luna with funding, is when they came around two years ago and hooked all the high schools up to the internet. Uh, our high school had a 12 megabit internet link at the time. We paid approximately $4,000 a year for that internet. The uh, Education Networks of America out of, I believe, Illinois, came in, they were hired by the state to do these standards so that all the networks were the same. They came in and put the same speed internet in our schools at 12 megabits, and the state now pays about $28,000 a year for the same speed. Uh, they said they had to do this because of the video technology equipment to do distance learning and whatnot. Well, nobody knows, but that equipment only takes 700 k bytes of bandwidth to do it so you can do it 
with very, very little, almost a modem. Okay. So you're telling us that the, the four thousand dollar year system would have handled the new one? It is exactly the same. Exactly. So they just wasted. Well, truth be known, there's a little thing called E-rate from the federal government. The state collects that E-rate to pay, and in our Marsh Valley, it's about 75 to 80 percent reimbursement. So it only costs the state 20 percent of that. But still, four thousand dollars versus twenty-eight thousand dollars. Now, when they uh, go out to bid for computers for the kids, I imagine the same thing's going to happen. The uh, RFP that the state put out for the computers is so long and so big that no one can download it and they've actually kind of locked it away uh, so that you can't even get to it without registering with the state to see it. Uh, it's a big RFP because all of it is bundled together. They didn't break it in little pieces. Whoever wins the computer device that goes in the school is going to be somebody like HP or Dell because they have to provide the computer and they have to uh, provide the support. They have to come out to Marsh Valley and pick up the broken ones and leave me new ones. So it's got to be a really big company. It's got to cover from border to border. So how many companies can do that? Very, very few. Uh, it won't be, and I kind of know this for a fact, that it won't be like an iPad. Uh, iPads are kind of like a smartphone. They're great for viewing, but if you have to type a paper in them, they're terrible. You can't create anything with an iPad. Part of their RFP was that these devices have to have a keyboard so that kids can create. Uh, so the other questions here. Uh, when did that RFP go out? Two, two, two weeks ago, two 10 weeks days ago. ago. Yes, and it's online, but you have to register as a vendor to download it. We had some people register that weren't vendors, uh, part of the state and try to download it and email it to everybody, but it was so big they couldn't even zip it. But it was so big you couldn't send it through any of the mail things because uh, the email stuff has a limit on how big the files could be. It was too big. Somebody said it was almost 600 pages long. So does the state uh, state how many uh, laptops or whatever that they need to bid on with that RFP? Uh, or what it, it, it's one per student, ninth grade to tw twelfth grade. And how many is that? How many I don't do you know. know. How, over how many years? Well, they, they've changed their minds, and, and it's kind of in flux from what I understand. Uh, this October, all teachers, ninth grade and up, would get a laptop or whatever device the it, it is. The teachers will, will receive one. Okay. So that they can start to learn how to use it and get ready for the kids to have. The next year, the students would get them, and it was supposed to be all ninth graders. Now they've changed their mind and they're having a, a lottery. If your school district is drawn, all the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders will get computers at the same time, which only makes sense. Let me tell you why. Is if I'm a teacher and I'm in high school, I teach 9th grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. I don't want to prepare lessons different for each grade. So they're smart in that. I give it to them. If your school's going to switch, switch. Don't make the teachers have double duty to use their computer and then the next class doesn't have computers in it. So that's okay, but some schools will have to wait three years before they get their laptops. Some of this is going to get bumped back. By July of this year, every high school was supposed to have the ENA again probably, come out and install wireless equipment in each high school to handle the load. In our school district, we have wireless in every building, but not enough in the high school to handle four or five hundred connections at one time. I can handle a hundred, hundred and twenty. So they have to beef that up. In my district, I could do that and install it to standard. In some schools, they couldn't. So they're going to hire someone to come do it again. And I'm sure it's going to cost us two or three times as much. Uh, you worry about kids taking care of the computers? That was one of the questions. Well, uh, I've got a comment. The one thing that, that is being forgotten here is the children. Who's going to get them ready to sit down in front of a computer and learn? Who's getting the customer ready? Okay. That, that's been addressed several years ago by the state of Idaho. They have a, uh, an initiative. Uh, so what? Uh, I taught at Stroban High School and I had many ninth graders that only knew how to surf the web. 
and couldn't do, couldn't write a paper. I don't know about other school districts. In our school district, by the time a, a, a student gets out of the eighth grade, he has to meet four criteria, and I can't remember what they are, but he has to be able to do a spreadsheet, word processing, uh, web searches, and I think it's called skills learning. They have to do a research paper and a presentation. Uh, I don't know. But they, by the, to graduate from eighth grade, they have to have that technology under their belt. That was a state curriculum type thing that they mandated years and years ago because we had to every year show them how we met that criteria. And we did. So it depends. I mean, just so clear. Your school is in charge of preparation up to that point. And I, I know, I mean, my kid can do all that. He's in ninth grade. And Most of our kids are I teachers can't keep up with it, but teachers. It depends, on the, it depends on the support from, you know, kindergarten clear up to this level to Have where they can actually. Have you got uh, Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, too. Some, some don't. And that's part. Yes, that's right. some of the problem is there are houses that don't have computers, believe it or not. And I know this is kind of ancillary to some of this discussion, but for one thing in our school district that we're worried about is where's the money going to be for adoption of new um, typing curriculum? How are we going to get new sorts of curriculum to teach our youngest kids how to use these computers yeah. and get this sort of thing going forward? It seems like you're, you know, we've used the cart and horse metaphor quite often, but when you're not teaching kids and you're not using the money to get them really ready for these computers in a lot of ways, uh, then you're not adequately preparing yourself to Absolutely. implement the technology. Well, the problem with schools have to with like the typing. Who has time to teach it? They have standards they have to meet, but they don't have time. It's not, it's not a standard. The state didn't say the kids have to type by the time they're in the sixth grade or the fourth grade. So the third grade teacher, she's too busy to teach them typing, and she doesn't get any brownie points to teach them typing. I would also add that I worry sometimes that we aren't serving. Yes. I worry sometimes that we haven't spent an adequate amount of time and money getting our computer labs up to the uh, standards they should be at before we're implementing these one-on-one -on -one devices. Uh, I also worry, given the salary cuts and some of the cuts that have happened over the, four, uh, the last four years, why are we implementing all this technology now? Why not wait till after we finish our TIA and our Common Core work? Why are we going to wait until we can rehire our media specialists? Before we're going to out uh, put it all, it roll out all this new technology. So I think there's some very real logistical problems That's we have right. before we should be doing this. Woo. Did, you, did you finish? Well, I had a lot of other things. But sorry. No, yes, your it's good. It's, it's good. good. Do you like it more? Greg, I got a lot of questions before you wrap up. For you can see me, you guys sort of left, left it hanging. People don't understand what some of the technology will do. But when, it, when a classroom of computers comes in, the kids can be surfing or distracted. Uh, there is software that's going to be mandated with this RFP that will be loaded on them. And what this software will do is when they come to a class, they actually join a group and the teacher can block and basically shut the screens off of their computers. Uh, part of that software is, is they can, when they're in this class, each teacher can say they can only go to these four websites or these 20 websites or whatever. And from the teacher's computer, she can broadcast to all those computers the lesson at the same time. So she has some control of what the kids are going to see. Parents don't realize that you can take control. As a network administrator, I can see where every packet goes on my network and who sent it at any time, and it's recorded. So, you know, I worry about kids taking it home, but part of this uh, mandate or uh, RFP to buy the computers uh, also has filtering software loaded on it. So when a kid goes home, he still can't go to playboy.com just like he can at school. Sure, they're going to try to get around it. Some of them are successful, but most of them aren't. But when they come back to school, I can kind of see it. And part of the district planning and the state told us there's no inferred privacy with these devices. If you go home, do whatever you want to and bring it back, and I see what's on it, then you can be in trouble. And there's no privacy. It belongs to the district. And uh, what happens when that computer gets left at home day after day after day after day? It, it's just like uh, I left my homework at home. They, they'll flunk. It'll hurt their grade. And who but there will be spares there. Who has to replace the computer if it never shows up? Well, that's part of the district's decision. They left a lot of this on the districts. Again, it's unfunded mandates. Uh, they will come in and repair them. Oh, no, those are funded mandates. <laughs> I They're work not every day unfunded. on unfunded ones. But, <laughs> but, but technology is not unfunded, though. They put a lot of money into that. Well, they don't put very much for exactly. what we get. Would you do me one more comparison? Um, 
you talked to me once about uh, computer labs compared to laptops and prices and stuff. Did you say it was more efficient to do labs? Yes. Uh, if you go downtown to Best Buy and go buy a laptop, run of the mill, what do you spend? Six, seven hundred dollars. Okay, the processor in that laptop and the memory and everything might run at 1.5 gigahertz. That's how many calculations a computer could do every second. For $500, I could buy a desktop computer that will do three and a half to four. So it's two, three, four times faster. Plus, they're almost bulletproof. If you've had a laptop, you know how many problems you can have with a laptop. A desktop, you have very few problems with. I was told that 40% of laptops are in the head. First year. Each, I don't know. In the first year. I, so. I have a little, what they call a netbook. It, it, you know, it's just a tiny little computer with a keyboard. And I figure that's what the state will probably, probably get. Uh, part of the mandate is they have to have an eight-hour battery life. Well, in four years, that eight hours is going to go down to about an hour and a half because that's just how batteries deteriorate. But again, they'll probably replace them every couple of years. There's a lot of problems on it. Like I said, technology is going to help them. Don't don't take me wrong. I think Luna's going about it in a little bit of a strange way, putting the cart before the horse again. Uh, but, but, they, but the state needs to guide us because, like I said, we can't have one district doing one thing and one district doing another. And, you know, I, I heard the comment that, you know, what fits at Pocatello isn't going to work, you know, in Soda Springs. But really, it kind of does. If you have something successful, it usually works anywhere you take it. But it does depend on the teachers. And if the teachers aren't on board, it's doomed to fail from the get-go. Our school district has done very good with technology, and by the time school starts next year, every teacher in our district will have the four fundamentals things in their classroom, you know, a projector, a computer, a smart board, or an interactive device. They'll have a tablet, they'll have a camera, they'll have everything they need to use technology. But we haven't invested hardly anything in in-services. What district to teach the teacher? Marsh Valley. Marsh Valley. Marsh Valley. How many students in that school? We have about 1,300. How many ninth to 12th graders do you have? About 430, 430. 450, I'm not sure. Is, is that where the heroin was found in the school? Yes. Yes. Well, it wasn't in the school. It, was, it wasn't it was, in the school. It they pulled some okay. kids of, See, I, over down the road from the school. I, after teaching at, at Choban for a year, you know, again, I go back to the students and their readiness to learn. And we heard them talk about teamwork and, and you know, self-motivation. Now, how many, what's the percentage of our students that are going to be capable? Too much ready to learn and sit down in the ninth grade to do this. You made some very good points about one of the things Go on there. Okay. Uh, one of the things I would like to comment on, and I believe this is kind of the same thing as what you were saying, was the rates at which kids fail regular classes versus online classes. Oh and you see a tremendous increase in the failure rate with online classes that you do opposed to regular classes. Um, and I think that is probably because of a lot of the things we've been talking about tonight. Um, but I worry that as we transition to some of these more online classes, a lot of kids who would learn well in a traditional environment aren't prepared or aren't that type right. of a learner, uh, and so they're going to do worse in these sort of online classes. That's right. Um, <laughs> as, as for like what ninth graders might be available, <laughs> might be uh, ready to yeah. to uh, use this kind of technology, yeah. I, I just remember back in American Falls, in starting in fifth grade, we all took computer lab, and you know. We've been, they've been doing that since the early 90s, uh, at least in the American Falls yeah, School District. Yes. Um, and that's where, you know, a lot of different, you know, school, different, school districts differ. Um, right. What we're doing in American Falls, uh, we've had the ENA come and talk to us, and we've, uh, or the, I think it's ENA, and, and we're going through the E-rate thing right now, and uh, when they tell you, you know, you're only going to be paying 15 to 20 percent of it, you know, it sounds like a great deal. Obviously, it's federal money, so it's coming from somewhere. We're all paying for it right. in a roundabout way. Right. Um, uh, our school district wasn't up to snuff uh, when it came to uh, the capacity and the bandwidth, and so E-rate's really going to be helpful for us and uh, just getting all of our buildings to talk to each other and, and get ready for um, 
the technology that's coming down the road, mainly you know the wireless capabilities. The you know the labs we have, we've got a lot of computers in the district right now, uh, a, a lot. Um, keeping them all up and running takes uh, um, one IT guy. We, we hired another one um, at, on a half-year contract just this year, and uh, that was something. When it came to budgets, we had to pick and choose uh, across all of the all of the schools. Um, uh, basically, their 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 supply funding and to pay for this one guy. And I don't know one thing that you didn't bring up. How much time? How much time do you spend um, getting all of your buildings to talk to each other to send all the data to the state when it comes to IC and stuff like that? <laughs> That's what I hear a lot as a school board member. Um, he, he spends about half his time um, getting all that data collected when he could be working on these older computers and keeping them running in the labs that we have going right now. So uh, there's going to be, uh, when it comes to you know, funding from the state, you know, we could probably use, uh, our, our, our IT guy's name is Thor, we could probably use three Thors, but they're not cheap. And, you know, uh, I wish we could pay our teachers as much as we pay him. That's the main thing. But you can't. So, um, they're worth it too, I guess. Yeah. I don't make it much more. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thor's leaving after this year. I know it. Yeah. <laughs> don't you be don't don't He'll be back. He'll be back. Well, Dean, I know you wanted to start the conversation off with technology because that is a huge impact. But that's 9th through 12th grade. And we still have early childhood, kindergarten through 8th grade that we haven't talked about. And the way the state is funding this technology was to take the money out of salary-based apportionment to pay for teacher salaries to buy the technology. And that has resulted in fewer teachers in the classroom for school districts. That's why there's a class out in Marsh Valley that has 57 kids in it. That's why there's a class of 32 in what grade do you teach? Third grade. Third grade. I know seventh grade in Grace, there's 36 seventh graders in all the seventh grade classes in Grace. Um, we have guidelines and statutes about class size. And we heard that, I, I believe that smaller class sizes, especially in the primary grades, is the foundation. That's the essential place where students first learn, and that's where we need to invest in more teachers in the classroom so we can have smaller class sizes. And I don't want those elementary and, and middle school teachers to be left out of the equation in this discussion, because that's the foundation for our young people. If we really want our students to learn, then we need to invest in those elementary grades and put more teachers in the classrooms and there is already technology in our classrooms and teachers do use it and it is a tool and I'll go back to what I said at the beginning of the meeting the teacher is the first most important teach you know helps the students learn more than a laptop or the side of the parent in the school setting, that teacher is key. And if we don't have good quality teachers in the classroom, and we have a small student to teacher ratio, especially in those early grades, all the technology in the world is gonna be used for remediation, which we already use a lot of technology now for remediation when they get into those upper grades. So the learning foundation starts early and we need to really invest in those early grades yeah. and make sure we have low class sizes. There, there is a side effect of this high school getting all these computers, is all the money the districts used to spend at the high schools is now going to go to the grade schools. It's, it, it, it's, it's a side effect. I used to spend probably three-fourths of my technology money to support the high school and middle school. Now the state's going to buy all these computers. I don't have to have 180 computers in my labs at the high school. All the kids have them. So that 180 computers is now going to move out to my four grade schools. 
And so you're saying I, the local, I think, though, the that, local uh, many people the point go to. That Maggie that's, was, right. was great. I think the point that Maggie was making uh, is a very important one that shouldn't be overlooked. And that is uh, really, from my observation, early childhood education uh, has been neglected and it shouldn't be. And, uh, you know, just waiting until kids are uh, reach a certain age to say that now we can teach to them uh, is silly. Uh, as a grandparent myself, uh, I know that uh, when I saw my daughter ask uh, my granddaughter if she was thirsty, and my granddaughter was less than a year old, and uh, she, you know, she uh, goes to my granddaughter and she makes a sign for milk, and she got a response. And I had always thought when we were raising our kids that they must have thought we were so stupid because they knew what they needed and they couldn't tell us. And here she was communicating, before this child had the muscles to form words, she could communicate quite clearly whether she was thirsty or not and which thing she wanted to drink. And yet we're waiting years after that to put kids in school or to start teaching to them. We're missing the boat. And then not to do an adequate job once we do get in the school system, I think Maggie is dead on with that. Tina. I'm Tina Arley, and I'm the president of the Board Education Association, but I'm also a kindergarten teacher. Um, <laughs> just a couple of remarks. Um, I have five computers in my classroom, so it's not that I don't use computers in kindergarten, and those kids come in and they know how to turn them on, they know how to turn them off, they know how to do everything in between. What they're lacking is their social skills, their interactions with each other, um, how to play together, how to share. Um, they need the hug. They don't need the computer screen. Um, I have um, some ESL students in my classroom, and their intervention with the, um, our teacher is just another session on the computer. They don't need another session on the computer. They need to talk with each other and visit and learn language. Um, one of my problems I have as a kindergarten teacher is that uh, kindergarten is not state mandated. Parents know it. Kids don't have to come to school. Um, there's no, we have no bite in it. Um, so if mom doesn't feel like getting up that kindergarten, he doesn't come. It's not the kid's fault. It just happens that way. Also in our district, um, to save money on the busing, we went to um, all day, every other day kindergarten. Sometimes my kids come to school two days one week and they don't come back for five days depending on days off and stuff. It's very hard to teach them what they need to know without that daily repetition and I'm sorry but a lot of them aren't getting it at home, that repetition of what we're teaching in the classroom. So um, the cutbacks have affected early childhood and, I, and I'm sorry but I am heartbroken also that um, our district just took out the three-year-old Montessori that we had. Um, I don't know if it was because of attendance or because of costs but Early childhood education, of course, very dear in my heart, so I think it's very important. But if we don't teach them how to interact and get along and all the basic skills that they need at our young level, then it's going to snowball as they get older. Uh, just a couple of comments on Dick Agnes. The, you know, we focus in on the technology and it's the funding that's really causing us the issue as it relates to the classroom. You know that train, I don't know whether that train's on the track or not, but if it is on the track, we've got to come back around and see how we, how we, can, make, how we can make it work. And that's a, the comments that have gone on here all tie into this in one way or another. I, you, you know, the more you listen, the more you find out the commonality that's really there in people's viewpoints. If they're people that can reason. What we're dealing with now and what's causing us our problems is that we have a politically driven agenda. It doesn't even come 
It, it really never even originated here. You have a politically driven agenda, and we, we've got to come back and recapture that. Early childhood education, you are exactly right, but it takes money. And we're back and we're talking about revenue, and these are the things that are going to affect you and the kinds of decisions you're going to make. But it's absolutely crucial. You got a guy, and I'm going to jump off on some tangent issues. You got a guy heading the House Education Committee who absolutely believes that the woman's place is in the home. And that is a significant place, don't misunderstand me. It's a significant place for man, too. He may become the Senate you know, Education but he, Chairperson. But, but that's, what, that's what you're dealing with, but we've got, to, we've got to combat that, but we've got to combat it, I think, in being smart. I don't think there's any point in trying to simply focus in and say that, that technology is bad because it's not. It is going to be something we, that, 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 that we're going to be using, and it's going to improve, but we've got to improve in terms of how we use it, because the absolute focus, as you said and others have said, is that it's a personal enterprise. And when you're dealing with those little youngsters, it makes a whole lot of difference when you're dealing with them directly and they're looking in your eye and they say, hey, you did that great. Good job. It's not the same kind of feedback that you get from the computer. They can learn skills from it, and they can learn skills from it very well, and more than that. But it's dependent upon that classroom teacher. So one thing that can be done there is what they tried to do this year, but it's, it's a long road to going, is that we've got to make sure <coughs> that that money is back there and is going to support the number of teachers that we need that are trained to use that technology in an intelligent way. Those are things, those are things we can do because the te technology is going to come at one time or another because it's useful. And I'll give you another example that breaks to a piece of, that, that talks to an issue in the elementary classrooms and any, every elementary teacher in here knows it very well is the fact that you have students in your classroom that aren't eligible for special education. So they're not eligible for special assistance. All they really need is a boost. They just need someone to work with them. You can't do it with the numbers that you have. And what do we have in statute? We have a statute for secondary students in statute that gives them extra money for those students. And we don't have it at the elementary level. Now you tell me how that makes sense. And that needs to be corrected. Absolutely needs to be corrected so that the money is put there to assist them. Because not only does that affect the student who's having the problems, but those are the same students that are slowing down if you put them in a reading group, that are being disruptive in that classroom and having a negative effect on, on, the, on the morning of that whole classroom. So I guess my point is we've got to come back and look at this in a smart and an intelligent kind of way, understand how important communication is, respect our schools, respect our teachers, and let them advise us, not telling us, but as a group, think of the comments that are being made here, as to what it is we should, be do we should be doing, and that is just exactly not what's happened. It's been done in the exact opposite way. It's been strictly by an agenda. And I think that's what's got to change. We've got to have communication back and forth. And, and you're absolutely right that it can't all be done at the local level, nor should it all be done at the local level. But there should be communication with that level, dialogue back and forth, so that it meets the needs of those levels, it develops the respect of those levels. And the same thing's true with teachers. You involve teachers, you communicate with them, their ego goes up. I don't care whether it's a teacher or anybody else. Their ego goes up and they'll, they'll climb mountains for you. But you treat them as though they're a pawn in the process and the exact opposite happens. And that's just exactly what's occurred. And a lot of that leadership is going to have to, is going to, have to come from the legislature. From the government. I really appreciate what Dick said here about how teachers are elevated into this process and made a significant part of the decision making and the input. 
And I absolutely think that that is key to getting back to really serving the, the students like we need to. Yes. And I, I really hope that no one will forget that we have teacher education programs in our universities where we're training the next generation of teachers and that their training should be appropriate to what they're going to face in, the, in these classrooms, that the type of people who are drawn into education are going to have a personal, financial, and professional future that is going to elevate their contribution. And, and I really think that some of those exceptionally successful <coughs> education systems around the world that are producing all those students that are way ahead of us in those international tests, they say that one common denominator is that they are very well paid and that they are drawing on the top third of the students at the university. The respected students. That's right. And so I really think that it's that level where we start with attracting the new generation that's coming up and we get the cream of the crop to start with. And that has to come from incentives and rewards from the people who make those decisions. You mean thirty thousand dollars a year isn't enough? <laughs> <laughs> I I don't think that's going to keep them out of the serving in the courts or the accountants. I don't think it's going to keep them out of there. Just check it. Yeah. I'm I'm Yorda Roberts. I want to ask: Does anybody know who is anybody putting together a plan? that will say what kind of legislation we need should these three laws be voted down in November. Where will we be if we do that? You need a plan to be equally important. You need a plan if they don't get voted down. I mean, I would like to think that, they, that, that that may happen. But a lot of those pieces of the trains on the track, and so you need to have a plan in terms of how you're going to make it work. And you can do that. But you have a plan in terms of how you make this work for you. What sort of changes do you have to make? Right? Who's making the plan? Well, well it's a group out of Boise for you. I, I do know one thing. Mr. Luna did not invent this. This, this was a, a plan in a can that was handed to him from the U.S. Department of Education, which they're trying to abolish back in Washington, D.C., because they feel it's a waste. This wasn't his idea. And there are states back there that have been doing this, but their scores aren't any higher than Idaho's. In fact, they're probably lower. And to you know, comment on money, there are states out there that have spent twice as much money per student that rate half what Idaho does. Idaho's teachers do a heck of a good job for what they get paid and for the money. I mean, we, we you know, per kid spend about $8,500. There are states that, you know, spend almost three times that, and yet their scores are a lot lower than ours. So money, you know, throwing money at it doesn't solve it all. It helps. Cost money. Tell me any industry. Yeah. Any industry. It doesn't, it, it doesn't invest in R and D, and puts. And, and if they're turning out a new product, they don't invest in it. Microsoft. You need, to, you need to invest in it. Right. And yes. the same thing is true they here. They don't. They're not going to start they don't do that. We do R and D. They give it to us, and we fix it for them. <laughs> That's nonsense. <laughs> just, just for the record, uh, the legislation that was presented in Idaho, the three bills, uh, one of those bills, the one that uh, attacked uh, bargaining rights for teachers' unions, uh, that exact legislation was introduced in uh, two other states and it was written by the American Legislative Exchange Council. It was not written by, yeah, that's where that came from. Uh, and that uh, piece of legislation uh, is, uh, it was unfortunate, I think, that uh, the state of Idaho adopted that. And it's quite clear that that was all for national politics. It was presidential politics. Teachers unions have tended to uh, support and teachers have tended to donate to political campaigns which tend to support teachers. And uh, there was a clear national intent 
to disempower teacher unions and public employee unions. So teachers got thrown under the bus to help elect a Republican president in 2012. That national politics that should not affect the future of our kids. And that's unfortunate that that's how that turned out. Uh, what we really wanted to do tonight was to hear the different perspectives on the subject of technology because I think there's no one who believes that technology should not be a, uh, applied in the classroom. The question is the extent to which it should be applied and what makes sense at uh, uh, in the third grade, uh, you know, uh, when you're talking about teaching kids to read versus talking about teaching high school kids uh, when you're talking about critical thinking skills like Keen brought up. Uh, and we have barely, I think, scratched the surface of this subject. But I think it's been a really productive discussion and I'm really grateful uh, for all of you who have spoken. What I'd like to know is, is there anybody who feels like they haven't had an opportunity to speak up. I know I see Rita back there who hasn't said a word and that makes me nervous. <laughs> she, just, she just came in. She was I like, just have to say about technology, I've been retired a few years, but I did my portfolio to pass my state proficiency in, in uh, technology and I dedicated it to two fourth grade boys because whenever I got in line they saved me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, but yes, there is a place for uh, technology in the classroom, but the teacher is the most important part. And I do work with interns from the University and Idaho State does put out a wonderful student teacher, a wonderful product for our schools and uh, our future of my profession, which I love. And uh, I tell them, well, uh, when I talk to them, you must remember, you might be the best thing that happened to that kid today, because a lot of kids come to school with a lot of baggage, and that teacher is probably the most loving thing they've had today. You're not the last. Uh, I just want to tell you all, I, uh, it's, it's great to me that uh, Mr. Lish, I, I want to call him that because that's the way I knew him, is here tonight. Um, he knows me very well. <laughs> and I was one of those kids, wasn't I? <laughs> you might say I had a desk near the principal's office and I learned a lot there. <laughs> so if you, if you want to know my position on, on uh, education, I, I'm very passionate about it. And, and I get to hear it every day too, thanks to my wife. She's worked very hard at, at doing very her job very well. And and she has great friends and colleagues down there in the school that she's in that they all work very hard and they put many more hours than what I believe Mr. Luna uh, thinks that they put out there. <laughs> it is not an eight hour a day job, is it? <laughs> I mean, anyway, so thanks to uh, Mr. Lish, <laughs> Uh, in my life has turned a kid that could have been a little too rambunctious into somebody that will pay attention and, and, and has taught me, I mean, I'm an equipment operator, uh, which seems like not a very smart job, which you get inside this new equipment and there's two computers in it. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know how to run them, <laughs> you're out of job. And so, I mean, thank goodness for the, the great teachers I had uh, growing up and, and, and the the primary education to me is where I think it starts. I'm, I've recently been a basketball coach for my daughter's team, and I started helping her when she was just young in basketball to teach her the same plays that the high school kids are, are learning. Why do we do that? <laughs> you know, so you got to you got to teach them when they're young, when they're most vulnerable and able to learn to get to this ninth grade position. You know, in my eyes, to be prepared to move on and compete against the rest of the. Uh, the rest of the country or states uh, and to put smart kids in smart places so they can replace people like me in legislature or you know in the community that so will make an, an effect and, and help us grow further you know so that's kind of my my position on education is you know I want to go in there and be able to be uh, the voice of the people and, and help us get good common sense 
you know, make sure our budget fits it, you know. Curriculum is probably one of the, we need to have curriculum first and then apply the technology to it, just like Greg said. I believe that that's the right way to go. But we also have to have the training for the teachers that they need. You can't just throw them out there and say, here, <laughs> see what you can do with that, you know. I think we need to we need to spend the money on the training, you know, to help these teachers know where to go. I mean, I, I don't know a teacher in here that wouldn't mind sitting down with Greg for a little while, you know, and saying, "Hey, really, I can do this," <laughs> you know. And so, anyway, that's 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 my my feelings on it, and uh, I appreciate y'all being here. I wish this there was like a hundred people here; that'd be great. <laughs> I'm Karen McCall, and I'm a retired teacher as well. Um, I taught special education for 11 years, and then I went into elementary teaching. Um, one of the things that you just write up that really was important to me is, again, saying what Dick had said about curriculum. This curriculum has got to come first. And who are the people that need to develop the curriculum? The professional people. That's where it has to be developed. And that's what's happened when, since Luna's come in. Before that, Dick and I were on the Professional Standards Commission for Long time. He was longer than I was, but I was on for eight years representing special education teachers, and we went around the state helping develop curriculum. What were teacher standards? What did they need for certification? What kind of uh, curriculum do we need in the schools? How do you evaluate curriculum? All of those things. I mean, that's the people that are on that workforce that are doing this day after day and have been trained to do it. They're the people that should be making the judgments about what is needed. And how can we use, what, what curriculum do we need? What kinds of learning style methods do we need? Not everybody learns the same. There aren't any two of us in this room that learn the same. And if you've been a teacher, you know that. I mean, I can tell you, that's not just my special education teaching. That is any teaching. I taught set 29, year, uh, 29 second graders and third graders many years. And there weren't two children that learned the same. And because I was a professional teacher, because I, like these other teachers, kept in touch with, was this child learning this? No, they don't get it. Okay, now how can I teach this a different way that this child can get it? Do I need to teach it a different way so this child can get it? Do I need to take four over here and teach it another way so they can get it? Do I need to put five of them over here together and let them help work it out together? I mean, there are so many things that teachers are equipped to do and have to do that technology will never be able to do. And I'm not against technology, but I'll tell you what, you've got to have some fantastically uh, gifted, trained, and excited teachers. You cannot treat teachers like them this and expect them to want to stay in that classroom. They have got to be respected. They have got to be looked to as the professionals they are. They have got to be asked what is it you think we should do and how should we do it. Because they care. They are there because they care. And they're the ones that should be helping you do this. And boy, I'll tell you, until the legislature and the sky, and I think our school districts, I think that I'm a teacher union person all the way, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Because our association is what helped us stand together and learn how to be strong. Learn to stand up together. Not because we were against anybody. Our school board members, our superintendents, I mean, you can ask them. They have a lot of respect for us. And I mean, we respected them as well. It's not that you're in an opposition type of relationship is they are in equal positions where you're standing up together and you're respecting each other and you're sitting down at tables and you're and you're debating and you're discussing and you're coming to resolution. I just think there's just a lot of things that are lost because people do not turn to the people, the educators in this case, that should be the ones that are telling, helping determine what needs to be done. When these Luna thing came Luna this Luna plan came on, there were no there were no teachers there were no principals, there were no superintendents, there were no school board members. There were none of these people that actually worked all the time to try and determine what's needed here to help children. There was not one person there that represents children. So I'm just, I'm, I'm saying go for it. You stand up, you have the courage to stand up for kids. If you stand up for kids, you're standing up for educators. So we want that. Thank you.
tell you kind of a funny story recently in our district. I was talking with a teacher, and we had just sent them to a national conference in Portland. Uh, they were learning about grading standards and grading practices. I don't know if many of you or if you have high schools in our district right now, but we're trying out a new curriculum, or a not, not really curriculum method, but a teaching methodology called ICU, Intensive Care Unit, to where we're going to say no more missing assignments, you're going to get it done. We're going to make sure that there's um, you know, a minimum amount of minimal uh, missing assignments, and we're going to make sure our kids are getting their work done, whether it be, you know, you know we're not going to let them slide through and take a test and they haven't done the work to get there. We're going to test them when it's time to actually test them. It's done a lot of great work in our district, but I was talking with a teacher who got back from this uh, conference in Portland. She said, they know who we are now. And I said, wait, what? What do you mean? We're not Iowa anymore. They know Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> they were, the te national teachers were so concerned with what's happening in the state with the Luna laws that they took the time to you know, recognize uh, who our, where our teachers really were from. And, you know, I wish it was a different story. I wish, you know, I was telling you stories about something new that we had done that was garnering us national attention. You know, one of the biggest things, and you talked about it, was local control for your school boards. That doesn't just mean your local school boards making all the decisions. It means having a public policy process where all the stakeholders are brought to the table. And that just didn't happen with these little laws. Um, recently, our board, which is a mixture of different personal partisan uh, feelings, a mixture of different personal ideologies, it's a mixture of different personal backgrounds and experiences. We all voted together to tell the Idaho School Boards Association that we did not support the way that these little laws came together and were made. And that was because we weren't consulted. Uh, our, school, our administration wasn't consulted, our teachers weren't consulted, uh, but big corporations from out of state were consulted, and I think that's a problem. Um, you know, there's a lot of technical aspects of the Luna Laws that we could talk about, and sometimes talking about the numbers isn't as fun, but I do want you to know that Dick is right. The finance issues are the big issues here. When we decide that we're going to fire teachers to pay for new technology, that is wholly different than a discussion about the merits of technology in classrooms. Um, you talked earlier about uh, the Promethean boards we have in our schools, and that's just one example of some of the great uses of technology that we've had. Uh, but it should be our uh, district's instructional technology committee, uh, which I serve on. It should be our teachers' input, and it should be things like our education board, which supplies some of this technology, being able to make those decisions on what goes into our classrooms. Uh, and I want to thank Dave for hosting the event, getting it organized. And I want to thank all of you for being here. Education is too important for these discussions not to be happening. That's right. In 2011, the legislative session, parents, teachers, administrators, school board members, and citizens who didn't have kids in school anymore all came to the legislature and they were ignored. Those laws were passed. I hope that people will remember and will vote this November, but that's going to be a very rough road this campaign to get people out to vote and the way you would want them to vote. You talk about low morale, high turnover, there was more turnover this last year than there ever has been. Low morale, it's because people were not listened to in 2011. I hope all of us work together for the improvement of education, and that's going to be a challenge. Every single one of us have we've got to work together to change what is in existence in the laws right now. Anyone else? Thank you guys very much for being here. I want to say I've missed the word. Two or three words. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, you, know, you, you, never, you never get over this. Uh, well, I, I got, I've heard a lot about Mars Valley, and I, and I really appreciate Mars Valley. I, got, I put seven kids through that school, and I don't know what we've got. There's only about 40 of my grandkids and great-grandkids <laughs> on their way through there. But that is important to me. It's really important. But what I want to point out 
whether you like it or not, two of our representatives from this area both voted and supported those laws. And I think they should stay home next year. Yes. That's my opinion. Yes. yes, sir. Lynn has a way of getting to the point. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming out this evening and for all your input. Uh, be happy to visit with folks afterwards. I think that uh, we've kind of come to a natural conclusion for this discussion. I would hope that we'll have the opportunity to have more of these kinds of discussions as uh, the year goes on because I think this is exactly what we need to be doing. We need to be listening to people who have a different experiences in education. I think that's uh, what's the most informative way that we're going to arrive at good <coughs> ideas about how to carry education forward. Thank you.